Hello, good people of Transition US. This is Rob Hopkins speaking to you from Totnes. Sorry, I can't be there in person. As you know, I don't fly. Uh, and in doing so, I think I've probably saved hundreds of tons of carbon sitting on various trains crawling across Europe. Uh, so I, and I would have done this live, but I didn't want to end up with a situation of me going, ah, the usual sort of stuff that can go wrong with Skype. So we're going to do it like this. I'm going to put some slides in and I hope this is a, a useful contribution to your uh, what looks like a, a, a wonderful conference. So before we start, I think it's time for a commercial break. And I'd like to just show you this short advert starring two people. Let's call them Dave and Doris. <laughs> Ask all recipes for a shrimp pasta recipe. My recommendation is champagne shrimp and pasta recipe. Main ingredients are shrimp, mushrooms, plum tomatoes, cream and parmesan cheese. Mushrooms. Tomatoes. ounces are in a cup. One cup equals eight fluid ounces. Buy white wine from Prime now. Your favorite white wine will be here between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. Dim lights to 70 percent. So the first thing that strikes me when I watch that video is, Dave, turn your own lights on and off. People have been doing it for decades. You just turn the switch in the wall. And why is Doris, somebody who is a, a professional in her early 40s, has managed to get to that point in her life uh, so de-skilled that actually even making for her dinner party what is basically heated up pasta with tomato sauce out of a jar and some shrimps on top. She has to go to Amazon for the recipe. She doesn't have any, any, any family, any friends around she can ask. She seems to have no cookbooks uh, in her house. It seems to be that actually, uh, you know, I, I have a deep distrust of anybody with a kitchen that tidy in films. I don't think she's ever cooked in that kitchen or done anything particularly. But the main thing I think that's really troubling about Dave and Doris in their kitchen planning their party is that they're so isolated. You know, this is a, a civilization that we live in now where, where they can do all of their shopping for the week with their Alexia pen thing without ever having to talk to anybody. They don't have to go down to the corner shops and risk having a conversation with another human being. You know, we know that we have what we call an epidemic of loneliness now, where people don't interact, where where people can go and do all of their shopping without speaking to anybody. And that's really, really dangerous. And also the amount of time that, they, that Dave and Doris are spending online in order to make this happen is really, really bad. We know the more time we spend online, the lonelier we get, the more depressed we get, the increased risk of mental uh, health problems there is. We know that for every hour we spend online, we become 5% more removed and more detached from our families and from our loved ones. So when I look at that advert, actually Actually, I think more about the world around them. If we all lived like Dave and Doris in their immaculately spotless clean kitchen, what's going on in the world around when they step out of the door? They step out into a world where there is no local economy whatsoever. It's been completely destroyed by Amazon, where agriculture is behaving in a completely different way, purely uh, to feed the lowest, lowest prices paid by Amazon. They live in a world where everybody is increasingly isolated. People don't meet in the street to share recipes, to share food, to share the food, the traditions from their own culture. People are isolated in their own places, eating, this, eating whatever Amazon uh, suggests that they eat. 
that's really, really hideous. So what I want to do really is, as you all know, we've been involved with an experiment over the last 10 years to tell a different story about the future because that story in that video is a very powerful narrative currently uh, in our society and it's a really, really terrifying one, I think, thought through in its implications. So what we've been doing is to tell a different story and what I want to do is to, uh, is to run through some of our learnings and tell you a few better stories from the transition movement. So I want to start with this, which is a thing that we created for COP21 in Paris in December 2015. We called it the Transition Manifesto, and it drew on some of the key things that we've really been doing uh, and learning from transition as we go along. So I'm just going to pick out some of those things and talk a bit more about them. So the first one is seize the opportunities that present themselves. And this picture is of uh, a bottle of beer that was brewed here in Totnes by a, a craft brewery that we established here as a sort of embodiment of transition local economy thinking called the New Lion Brewery. And the picture you're seeing there is of a beer that we made that was called the Miller's Brew, using locally grown spelt <coughs> uh, to celebrate the launch of a project called Grown in Totnes, which is the first time this town has a mill for about 100 years. They raised £26,500 in a crowdfunder in order, to, in order to put the mill back. And when I went down for their launch, and this is a picture of Holly Tiffin, <coughs> who, is the, uh, who started the whole project and runs it, who's brilliant. And I went down to the launch that they did where they invited all the people who supported the crowdfunder to come along and see what they were doing. I was really struck with the thought that the shift from a kind of diverse, uh, interconnected, a more resilient economy over the last 50 years to the increasingly monocultural one we see today has been a process of destroying all the small, destroying the diversity, destroying the artisans, the craftsmanship as it gets narrowed down into the kind of Amazon vision of the future where they even tell you the recipes before you start cooking. Actually, what we see when we turn it the other way around, as you're doing, as many transition groups now, 50 countries around the world of people doing transition, what we start to see is it, what it looks like when it starts to go the other way. And the way I like to think about it, it's like when we stop interfering with, uh, with a piece of ground, we stop mowing the grass, we just leave it, and we have this process of it starting to turn back into a forest, where first come the, the, the pioneer plants, the weeds, uh, then comes the scrub, then come the trees. We have a process where what nature wants to do, if we just leave it, is to move towards diversity, towards abundance, towards complexity. What we keep doing is, is dumbing it down and stopping that from happening. So it takes a huge amount of energy to move towards the Amazon model because actually that's completely unnatural and that's not instinctive. What you see when you start to move the other direction well, that's so exciting and gives me so much hope is you start to see that complexity, that diversity kind of f building on itself, feeding on itself. You get these positive cycles. So she started milling grains again. We can now buy local flour, local oatmeal. We then start to brew with those. We make stout using totness produced oats. We make beer using spelt, beer using einkorn, these different kinds of grains. That then feeds an interest in us saying, so where could we get local hops from? There's now somebody started growing hops on the edge of totness. Where could we get such and such from? You know, it all starts to feed, and, and, and you see this with the craft beer, the local food movement in the US as well. It's really, really exciting. So for me, there's that thing of saying, there are so many opportunities there when we can put our transition glasses on, that we can look through and we can see what's happening, and we can start to tell the stories about what that looks like in practice. So the second one I would say is be creative, playful and open and it's one of the things that has been so delightful to observe about the transition movement uh, over the last 10 or 11 years. And last weekend I was up in London in Tooting where Transition Town Tooting who are one of the projects who do such amazing stuff with um, uh, bringing arts and creativity in, into what they do, did this thing called the Tooting Twirl, where it right, Tooting is basically a high street through London and houses off and shops off that. They don't have like a, a green or a community space, but right in the heart of Tooting there is a bus turning circle, just a big round area where buses wait and idle their engines right next to people's homes. The air pollution issues are really, really bad. So they created what they called a pop-up village green, all based around the idea of what if. What if? And those are two such powerful words that have really underpinned transition from the beginning. What if we printed our own money? What if we turned that place into a garden? What if, and always followed up with, well, let's try. 
Why not? Let's give it a go. So in Tooting, they created a pop-up village green. Literally, they put grass down on the road and they had music and they had stalls and they had all kinds of stuff. And it was just fantastic. And it gave people a sense of what's possible. They, they, they saw that space for the first time in their lives in a completely different way. And I really wouldn't be surprised if I went back in five years time uh, and that space had become a village green. The next one I call Put Care at the Centre, and it's been one of the really fascinating shifts uh, over the last few years of transition is to say, actually, maybe it's not all right just to say what we think this place needs is to cut its carbon em emissions to be more resilient, but to start by going to the place and saying, what do you need? And how can we meet that in a way that really builds resilience here? And how can we put care at the center, how we look after each other, how we communicate with each other? This is a project in uh, near Wigan in the north of England uh, called Green Slate Farm, where the transition group took over a farm that had been run by the local government who didn't want it anymore. They bought it into community ownership uh, and they created it as a care farm. So they're taking on a lot of the services that the local council didn't want to do anymore. So they provide a lot of care for different people who come there, get lots of support, but they also learn to grow food. They've built a straw bale kitchen. People learn how to grow food. People get affordable meals there. You know, we can provide care for the people around us so much better uh, than, than, than local government and national government can. Uh, and there's so much that we can do by stepping up into that as well, I think. The next one is uh, invest in your community. And invest in your community is something that, that we see increasingly. You know, when, when, when it becomes very volatile, the idea that, that we would put money in a bank or we would put money, you know, we see all the horrible things that are done with that. And the divestment movement has been so powerful in terms of starting to change those stories and the people at Standing Rock and the work they've done encouraging divestment from those companies. But we can do that every day in terms of how we, how we decide to, to, to invest any money that we might have. And some of the really fascinating things in transition have been when people have set things up that people have been able to invest into. This is uh, in Bath, Bath and West Community Energy, community-owned energy company that came out of Transition Bath and Transition Corsham. They've now raised about £13 million in investment from local people to fund a whole wide range of, of renewable energy projects that are all in community ownership or generating turnover for more projects. You know, there is a new economy, a new economic model uh, being developed here and it's, and it's one that's very, very exciting, I think. Enable the community ownership of assets. How can we as communities own things, uh, places, uh, buildings, infrastructure, businesses? And, uh, and there are lots of really good examples of that starting to happen now. This is uh, here in Totnes where we recently uh, got planning permission for something called Transition Homes, which would be 27 straw bale homes, the biggest single straw bale development in the country, which will be built as, as training uh, for people and will all be in community ownership and will all be held as affordable housing. And I love the ambition now that transition groups are starting to look and become housing developers, become energy companies. Uh, all of that stuff is, is, is really important. The thing about transition homes is, you know, sometimes the things that we imagine are uh, uh, the, the manifestation of transition. When, when people come here to Tottenham, for example, the stuff they expect to see, the super swanky, amazing eco homes or the big uh, massive renewable energy projects, those things, as I'm sure some of you know, take a lot of time and a lot of stamina. And, uh, and I have nothing but the most enormous respect for the people who have got projects like Transition Homes, which have taken eight years to get to the stage of planning permission. And it makes me think that actually one of the real qualities of doing, <coughs> of doing transition is a kind of uh, deep stubbornness and, uh, and a recognition that the projects that we're doing are something that we will be doing for the next five, ten years of our life. There's a kind of a level of commitment of, I'm going to see this happen. And, and I love to see that, that deep kind of uh, stubbornness. I think it's a really uh, powerful quality. Another part of it is uh, keep telling great stories. For me, one of the most powerful things about transition is the story that it tells. The stories we can tell about the place where this has happened, the place where that's happened. A lot of my role really over the last 11 years has been just telling stories and hearing stories from one place and taking them to sort of cross-pollinating stories. And this is a story that I really love from London where a guy called Leo who worked as a sustainability consultant and he was always busy and rushing around with his mobile phone um, 
uh, hurt his foot and had to spend three months with his foot in plaster and uh, he had to take three months off work and just all he could do to convalesce was just walk very slowly around his neighbourhood in London. And around that time he read a story in the paper about an old woman who lived in uh, Bournemouth, I think it was, who died in her flat and nobody found her for nine years. And it really got him thinking about, well if I died in my flat, who would even know? I don't even know anybody on my street at all. And uh, one day, and he, well, as he was walking around very slowly, taking in his neighbourhood for the first time, really, um, in any kind of depth, he, he noticed there were lots of grapes being grown in different parts of this neighbourhood of London. And one day when he was walking in the park on a whim, he asked uh, an, old, uh, an older gentleman in front of him uh, if he had ever made wine. And, and this man replied to him, My friend, uh, the soles of my feet are still purple from the first 29 years of my life where I trod, uh, where I trod grapes. He was Italian and, uh, and so they started working together on this idea of well what would it look like if we made some wine in the street? They both lived on the same street. Uh, so uh, one day they, they set up in the middle of the street uh, uh, like a pit for treading grapes and invited everybody from the street to come and be part of the whole uh, process. He met all of his neighbours for the first time and they produced the, uh, wine which they call um, uh, unthinkable drinkable. Uh, the wine is absolutely disgusting but that's really not the point. The point is uh, it's about bringing people together. They now do this every year. I think the wine has got slightly better but not much. Another one is weave your community together and that's one of the things that I love to see happening uh, in transition and, and I see it here, those, those clever ways of bringing people together, enabling conversation. The decline of conversation is one of the most troubling uh, trends in our, in our society today, I think. And, uh, uh, and I love to see when that happens. And, and this is a, an amazing place in the northeast of France called Ungersheim in Alsace, where, which I visited uh, a couple of years ago and there's now, there's now a film made about it in France. It's become quite a celebrity. They have a mayor there called Jean-Claude Mensch who watched In Transition 2.0 and said, we'll do that, all of that. And uh, they're doing the most remarkable stuff. They started the biggest solar farm uh, in that region of France, 5.3 megawatts. They've launched a local currency called the Radish. They changed all the street lighting to low energy lighting. The swimming pool is heated by solar energy. They changed so that all the food served in the school and in the local council buildings is now organic. They created a, a new eight hectare market garden to grow that food, training local young people to become market gardeners. They built this beautiful building you can see here out of local materials as a place to process that food and to create more jobs out of it. They built a straw bale co-housing project. They've uh, created about 100 jobs. They saved about 600 tons of carbon uh, a year. It's the really most fantastic project. And when I went there, they had sold the school bus and bought a horse, which you can see in the middle here. And uh, uh, when I gave a talk, an old man came up to me. He said, Rob, he said, all this transition stuff is great, but that horse is a bit much. Uh, and I said, what do you mean the horse is a bit much? He said, well, the horse feels like we're going backwards. I said, but does it really? I said, I saw the kids going to school today and there was a magic in that experience for them of being taken to school like that. Um, but when you watch the film about Ungersheim, the most important thing that you see is not the 21 projects that were started in Ungersheim. What you see is the connections of people coming back together again, saying, I felt so lonely, so isolated, now I feel part of something. Uh, you see this sort of, the community uh, reweaving itself back together again. It always makes me wonder whether we should replace gross domestic project, product as a, as a measure of our economic success with actually a measure of how many children are playing in the streets and how many times we have meals in each other's houses. The next one is turn needs into opportunities. You know, we look around the places where we live, there's so much that needs doing that we can feel overwhelmed, we can feel despondent, we can feel isolated. Well, all of those are an opportunity to really, uh, to, to, to approach them in a very different way and to create extraordinary things, I think. This is a street in Brussels, where, which is the red, in the red light district area of Brussels. The families who live either side of this street live with many of the challenges that living alongside prostitution uh, brings for, for, for people and families. And they suffered for years with men all night driving up and down this street looking for women. 
uh, and so on. And so one day the council announced they were going to put these two blocks of concrete, you can see in the picture here, to block off the road to stop that happening. The transition group, who, who many of whom lived on this street, said, we can do a bit better than that. So they asked if they could make a garden. The council gave them money for the materials. The people came out of their houses and built this garden. Now this garden is not going to feed the street. It's not going to feed one person. Each family has a meter square patch in it. What it does is it, is it brings people together for the first time. It changes the space. It changes the, the way people think about it. People told me that uh, you know, this was a place you would never stand still here. You would put your collar up and you would walk quite quickly. Now people hang out here. Uh, when people go out and start working in the garden, uh, uh, children come out and start playing in the street. Never ever happened before. They told me that one day they were there and a tour guide turned up with a whole load of, with one of those very tall flags and a whole load of tourists. And I said, ah, well, you're now a vegetable tourism destination, that's why. Um, so, so these kind of projects are, are, are really, really important because they, they bring people together to change the story uh, about a space and to give people the confidence they can go on and do other things, which is perhaps the most important thing about them. The last thing which I think really feeds into your uh, event and that I would like to pull out from our manifesto is celebrate often. Because what you have all achieved and what you have all done over the last 10 years in your places far flung across the US and elsewhere of, of, of trying to uh, kindle this uh, transition uh, flame into being is just so wonderful. And we, and, we, and we work so hard and we so seldom stop to celebrate and to pat each other on the back and to reflect, you know, how's this going? How could we do this better? But stopping and celebrating is, is, is really vital. Transition Town Lewis were one of the very, very first transition groups to start here. This is their really remarkable birthday cake that they made to celebrate their, their recent 10th birthday celebrations, complete with a marzipan windmill, solar panels, uh, a Lewis pound flag, uh, vegetable boxes, all kinds of different things. You know, what I love about transition is it's a movement that is learning how to celebrate uh, and how to really weave that into everything, into every meeting we should have some degree of celebration. What I've loved about working with you over the last uh, two months or whatever has been how you do this, how you do that. So I really hope that into your event and, and into everything that you do, there's, there's really some time for celebration because what you've achieved so far is, is really extraordinary. And I'm sure I'm over time, so I just want to leave you with, with, with one last image. And I travel around a lot, as I said, by, by train. Uh, and I was in Copenhagen recently in Denmark for a fantastic uh, event with transition groups there. And when I was there, I saw this and uh, I thought, I need to take a photograph of that. Because, you know, we live in a time where we have amazing path designers. You know, we have people who design paths for us to walk along and they're very well trained and they've studied path design at university and they really know their path design and, and, and they're very good at designing the best paths. But actually, we're actually better at designing the paths that we should be walking on. You know, this photo is beautiful for me in terms of if you don't like the path that's presented for you to walk on, just make your own path. Just head out. Other people will follow. And, and my hope is, and what we start to see happening in places now, is that the paths that we create by just setting off, deciding to walk those paths, they become the paths. Because they're the paths that meet our needs better. They're the paths by people who understand the place, the needs of the place. You are the best path designers in America, you know, in terms of creating where, where your communities can go uh, and what they can achieve. So I, uh, I have nothing but, uh, but, but gratitude and admiration for the work that you've been doing, for the organisers of your fantastic conference. I wish you all the very, very best uh, and, and all strength and solidarity in the next 10 years of transition in the US. I so look forward to hearing your stories and have loved hearing them all so far. Uh, thank you so much and uh, see you again soon.